what is it that we desire today? Is it stuff? Is it things? Is it a relationship? And while those things may be good, are we forfeiting God's best in our lives by putting those things before God? We're going to talk about that today, but before we do, the band's going to sing a song, and I'd love to invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Good morning, Forefront. I am so glad that you are joining us today, whether you are in person or online, and we would love to connect with you. You can comment, DM, or text us at the number below. For those in person, you can fill out a card and drop it off in the lobby after service. And everybody can head to our digital hub at ForefrontChurch.info, click the connect button, and let us know how we can help you on your journey with God. Each week, we take a time to practice generosity. Now, if you're new with us, please don't give. We want service to be a gift to you. Giving is for those who call Forefront Home, and you can give digitally at the links below. And for those in person, there are stations at the exits to give as well. Thank you for your generosity and helping people to find and follow Jesus. Have you ever thought about joining a small group? Now is the time. Today and next Sunday between services, you can meet small group leaders who would love to have you join them. You can also email dan at forefront.org to find out more information and get connected as well. We would love to have you join in one of our awesome small groups so that we can partner with you on your journey with God. Above all else today, we want you to know that you are loved by God and this church. This is a place to belong before you believe. You matter, and we're excited to worship God with you today.
Good morning, Forefront. We're so glad you guys are here with us this morning. If you would stand up with us, we're going to sing a couple songs to God and about God. And we would love it if you join in.
Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning light.
you know, coming out of that song, we're on the idea that God makes a way for all of us. Um, you know, no matter where we are in life, sometimes it's easy to feel lost. And I don't know if this is something that's happening to me as I'm getting older, but I just feel like the world's nutso. Um, is anybody out there with me? Does the world word, feel a little crazy word. sometimes, right? So, you know, you have news over here and news over there, and you have opinions and, and beliefs, and everybody's just trying to figure out how to get along in this crazy world. And I just want to be able to step back and recognize that, like, no matter what the noise is, that God has a way for me to find some peace. God has a way for me to move forward, and that's true for everybody in this room as well. One of the things that breaks my heart as someone who's been a believer for a while is when we feel like that way isn't there, and maybe it's something we've been through in our lives or something that somebody has told us, and if you've ever been in that spot, this next song we're going to sing is really for you to make a connection.
guys can have a seat. God, we thank you for this morning, the time we get to spend together in your presence. God, we thank you for your unshakable, unchangeable, undeniable love for each one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Venture, if you will, for a brief moment to back in middle school. Yeah, for some of you, you're shaking, shaking or you got the twitch because it's, it's a thing. Like, you're just like, I don't want to go back there. And beginnings of middle school was interesting for me. Uh, my parents let me have a bowl haircut because they didn't love me. And, um, <laughs> and so when I walked in, I didn't have a ton of friends. And, but the friends that I did have, we were into skateboarding. And at the time that wasn't like a cool thing, like it sort of is now. And so we were ostracized and we walked into the lunchroom. Now the lunchroom can be a horrible place. And so for you guys who are in middle school, I love you. I'm so sorry. It gets better. It really does. Um, but when you walk in and you get your food and we sat down and we just eat our food, do our thing. And I was on a steady diet, middle school through high school of chicken patty, soggy fries, uh, chocolate milk. That was my diet for lunch until I graduated. And so we eat the food, we go and throw it away. We go put our tray away and we wait for the lunch monitor to say that it was done and then we could go back to class. So we're sitting there talking, hanging out and panic sets in. Like dread happens. And I go, oh no, oh no, my mom's gonna kill me. Where are my glasses? Now, for you guys who are doing, you know, like you had a retainer at one time or something happened, you set something on the tray and I go, it's in the trash. I know where I put the trash and I look up and the janitor has already gotten things ready for the next lunch period. And so all the trash bags have been tidied up, brought out to the dumpster and it's just empty trash cans there. And I know what everything inside me, which you know now is that I am now gonna become Oscar the Grouch and I am going to get into the dumpster. So I tell the lunch monitor what happened. They go, I don't know where my glasses are. I, they, I, they were on my tray and I, and I threw them away. And so like I, we go out and we're digging through. And so now 
we dig through, can't find it. So now I have trash on me. I don't have my glasses. And I have a bowl haircut. This is bad. Bad. It's the trifecta. And so I had to do what the only thing I knew to do is I got my gym clothes that I had. So that's extra fun. And put those on. Already had gym, by the way. Put my gym clothes on. Put my nasty clothes in a bag. Went throughout my day. Except, huh, it's really weird. After I got changed and I went back to class and I sat down at my desk, I happened to reach in. Anybody want to know what was in my desk? Anybody got any idea? Any idea? My glasses. Yeah, my glasses. So now I'm there, sweaty gym clothes, smelly other clothes, bowl haircut, glasses are here. Humiliation just across me. And the thing is, I would never have jumped into the dumpster if it was like a rotten half-eaten sandwich. Like none of us go out of our way to dig into the trash if it's something that's awful, except for there's plenty of times in life that I've done just that. That when I came to God, there were a lot of things that God goes, that's not good. Let's change that. You're going to die to self. I'm going to throw all this in here. The problem is, and I'm sure you guys have never done this because you're perfect. Every one of you, well, most of you, is that I have a tendency to go back to what God said isn't good. And I want to encourage you, and all of our notes today are on Facebook and Instagram, that God doesn't make mistakes when he, throw things out, when he throws things out. Quit going back to the dumpster. You see, we're in this series, Reframe, where we're looking at the words of Jesus, not the words of Jesus through the lens of what your grandma or grandpa or mom or dad or friend taught you, not the words of Jesus through the life experience that you had that was very difficult, and no one's discounting that. But because of the lens of what you've been through, you now view the words of Jesus through that lens. And so when God has thrown out those things, you then say, well, I hear the words of Jesus, but, you know, I've been hurt and things have been wrong. And so I, I have to go back there because there's some of those things that feel really good. God does not make mistakes and what he has thrown away needs to stay thrown away. And that begins to change and be toxic in our perspective which is why we have to reframe the words of Jesus without any other things in the way. Rich Wilkerson's a pastor in Miami, and he shares that a poison perspective is absolutely what prevents your progress. And when we go back to the things that God said are not good for us, we put those things on. It's like me jumping out of the dumpster in nasty clothes, going, why on earth did I do that? For nothing, I ended up finding out and for many of us, it leads to something very, very bad, which is why we have to jump into the words of Jesus. We started this with his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, where he gets up and we need to explain, and I explained it last week, but to give you cliff notes if you weren't with us last week, the climate that's happening with people is awful, that the military in Rome has taken over the land. Not only that, they are now in the pockets of the religious leaders and the officials, and all the people that have influence. It's so the people, you and I, have then looked at this, and the people want something to be done. It's so they hear about this guy named Jesus. And Jesus has been known to, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to give sight to the blind. He has said that he's ushering in a new kingdom. And everybody's like, oh yeah, it's about to get Braveheart up in here. Yeah, freedom, we're going to do this. And they show up and they go, what is he going to say that we're going to wait and this is going to be an uprising? And instead he starts, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What? People, imagine. There's whisper. What is he talking about? This blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah, we're poor. We need. We need to. I, I just blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. He continues on. It says, "Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth." Bless and don't miss this. Who hunger and thirst? Say, my my soul yearn. What does my soul yearn for? How does it really look to be blessed? who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for your own self-righteousness, for the righteousness of God. I hunger and thirst that God would be rising up in my life and not me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And the people hear this, 
And it begins to ring some bells for them because they had heard back in Old Testament times in a time gone by of men and women who had risen up and shown this kind of character, who had reframed the movement of God in such a way that he was the focal point, that they weren't going back to the dumpster and putting things on that they didn't need to, that it wasn't poisoning their perspective. They looked to these men and women and go, we want to learn from them. There was this guy named Moses. See, Moses was an amazing man of faith. Moses was actually counted as one of the most amazing followers of God. And he was leading a group of people with a couple others, but they got a little jealous of him because he had a connection with God that was unlike what they had. And so they started to point fingers. They started to whisper. You see, sometimes when we don't get the things that we want or we see things aren't the way that we desire, we begin to have a poison perspective and we reach for those things that God has already put to death. And so I want to jump in over in the book of Numbers in chapter 12, to see what happens when somebody follows God and other people well, they come after him. Starts in verse 1. Miriam and Aaron began talking against Moses because his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. They said, no, they didn't like this. They didn't like it at all. They thought it was bad. You went outside of your people. This isn't good. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They're like, listen, we, we, we got a little something to say too. Maybe Moses isn't all that. They asked, hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. He heard the murmur. They, he heard the gossip. He heard the things. And so, and the Lord heard this. And now Moses, a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And so as the people hear these words from Jesus, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit their... Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They remember and can look back to a person like Moses. And this is what they're stirring around in their heads. So at once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent meeting, all three of you. This is, come here. It's like, dad comes in. All right, kids, come in here. And it's like, uh-oh. They come out to the tent meeting, so the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down a pillar in a cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. Okay, you're all here. You two that had the offense, come on now. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions, and I speak to them in dreams. And so they understand this because they had been leading, and they had had these things happen. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face. Moses has a different connection with God because of his faithfulness to him. Because he sought after and thirsted for the righteousness of God, not himself. I speak with him face to face clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Now, if you and I are Moses, and we have been come at like that, we have been accused, we've been gossiped about, whatever, uh, for some of us, oh boy, we're about to lash out right now. We've taken out our hair, taken off the glass, we're ready to, you know, duke it out. We go to social media, and we're passive aggressive as can be on there. Maybe we're not passive aggressive, maybe we call them out. I'm going to tag them, I'm going to let them know. We get angry. We see none of that with Moses. And the people hear the the movement of Jesus, and it stirs in them people like him. Going, what what should we act like in in the climate at which we find ourselves in? How should our spirit be? I think it should match up to the guy who can raise the dead. Not what I want, not the, you know, freedom. No, I need to match Jesus. And that isn't congruent with how I feel. And so I must be wrong. Because I'm not going to go back to the dumpster. Jesus has already taken care of that. And I want to encourage you, maybe ask some questions. Is that everything you face now and everything that Moses was facing in that moment is preparing you and I for what happens next? And so, question is, how are you handling now? Who are you trusting? Because if we are going to keep going back to the dumpster, and for some of us, we never left the dumpster. That's where we've been. God finds us a hot 
stinking mess. He goes, I love you. I love you and your mess. That's why I sent Jesus. But we're not going to stay there. You're going to get out of that. And you're going to leave that behind. But Jesus, I wrote, nope. You know, but I really like that. Nope, nope, nope. You're going to leave that behind. Why? Because I know what's best for you. You need to trust me. And if you don't hear anything else, my prayer is that you hear this, that trusting and desiring the desires of God and the movement of God will lead to the road of God's blessing. When you and I say, I'm going to trust him, not me. I'm going to trust him, not talking heads. I'm going to trust him, not this network or that network or this website or this guy who sits in his mom's basement and blogs, but Jesus. When we trust him, that is when we watch the road to blessing. But when we dive back in, our perspective gets poisoned. And when we dive back in, we see things through a horrible lens because it's a selfish one. It's one that we frame the words of Jesus how we want to. And so we see things like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then we have a poison perspective. We view that righteousness like us, not like him. And there's some things that we see in the life of Moses that echo the words of Jesus. What happens with blessing? You see, a blessed life, and we see this through Moses, answers accusation, answers hurt, answers just offense. A blessed life answers those things with gentleness. Why wouldn't Jesus talk about the things that were happening? Why didn't Jesus address that Rome had come in and completely tainted the culture? Because Jesus knew something that even over 2,000 years later, we who love life, but sometimes can be, uh, I'll say about me, not you, dumb as a box of rocks that we still don't get even today, is that the heart change is the only thing that moves this world forward. The heart change towards Jesus. You see, when we see that the blessed life answers these things with gentleness, we see that Jesus is the example. We don't go back to the dumpster because outrage, you know, Chris said this, you know, this place is nutso. Yes. And when we see that and we have a poor perspective, we answer it not with gentleness, but with outrage. And outrage does not mirror the movement of Jesus. It doesn't. Now you might say, Jason, there was this one time Jesus went up in the temple and he just got the whip and he cracked that out and he ran everybody out and that's what we need to do. We need to, are you Jesus? So you, you have the market cornered on when there needs to be righteous anger. You've got that so under control. And they're like, well, I, I, you've ne you don't name call people. You don't whatever. You don't. Well, Jason, you don't under. No, no, no. Because Jesus came and Jesus said, these things are in the dumpster. And if I wouldn't tell a five-year-old, you know what? You can go to school and that kid that's being mean, you call him a jerk. If I wouldn't teach that to that, then I wouldn't go out and say it. And so we don't move in outrage. Because it doesn't at all mirror the movement of Jesus. We see that a blessed life, and we see this with Moses. He doesn't lash out. He goes, you know what? You guys did this, and I'm going to be gentle and kind. Look out, because God's about to call you up and call you out. And he just stands back. And he lets God take care of it. And I love that. And that's the same way that you and I should be. Not that we shouldn't care. Not that we shouldn't be involved in the things of this world. But we should say that this world God is sovereign over every single bit of it. It's so my life that's blessed by him that I'm going to operate as someone who thirsts for his righteousness and I'm going to be filled and I will be kind. You see, and I want you to hear this, that when we thirst for righteousness, the righteousness of God, that it quenches the thirst for being right. When you and I are striving after and thirsting and getting just the righteousness of God, we don't have to go and be right. I had somebody message me this last week. They said, Jason, you, you don't post a whole lot on social media. I said, yeah. They go, why? I go, have you seen what's, what's going on there? And um, I said, Jason, over the last couple of years, there's crazy stuff happening, and, 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 and I don't see you speak out on it. I don't think you care. I said, stop there for a second. I said, so if it doesn't make its way digital, then it doesn't happen, Right? I said, I haven't seen you post about taking a shower, so apparently you don't shower. 
Well, well, no, that doesn't mean, I, I haven't seen that you fed a homeless person, so clearly you hate homeless people. Whoa, well, Jake, that's not what I'm saying. I said, what are you saying? I said, so you're believing the worst about me. I'm trying to my best, even though I fail to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just because I don't post about it doesn't mean I don't care. It just means there might be things happening that you don't see. But outrage culture says, I have to say this. I have to, what, speak into an echo chamber because I haven't yet seen any of you across the world post something, say something, do something. If someone saw it online, they go, man, I never thought about that before. You're right. just doesn't happen. And so I'm going to leave the dumpster over here. I will no longer move in outrage. God, I will thirst for you. Michelle Poehler says this, that most of the time growth option, that option is the one that's the scariest because it means we actually have to change. And there have been too many times in my life where God said, put it in the dumpster. I held on to it. And then I go, man, I'm having a hard time reading the Bible and praying and looking at this world the way it is, and I'm angry and frustrated. The guy goes, yeah, because you keep holding on to the stuff I told you to let go of. And so I need to be a man. You need to be a man or a woman or a student who says, God, I trust you. God, I will move with gentleness, and I will trust you. You see, and that's hard because, and this is why I love looking at the life of Moses in light of the words of Jesus. Because a blessed life teaches us and shows that while we can't always understand the why, we can trust in the who. And so Moses doesn't understand why people are gossiping about him and saying mean things about him, but he doesn't have to understand because he knows the who. He trusts in the who. And you know what? Sometimes that's difficult. Maybe you've been there where something happened and it was hard and you just go, man, I'm having a difficult time trusting in the who. Yesterday, well, my wife and I celebrated uh, 17 years married together. And uh, yeah, uh, we didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, I don't know how she stays with me. I'm a mess. Um, and she came out, I was sitting on the, our patio, and, you know, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. And um, she looks at me, she's like, what's going on? And, um, and, I, and I start, like, bawling, because... Because I, I, I'm just an emotional dude. And if you don't like emotional people, then you can just talk to Jesus about that. We have emotions. That's how we are. And, um, and, I, and I'm tearing up. And so she, what's wrong? And we start talking. And uh, I say, there's, and I list some things that are just hard. You hear, you hear things. You watch things. The world, you know, wacko. Yeah. And so she sits on my lap. And, you know, we just kind of remind ourselves that it's not about the why. It's about who. And it's difficult to do that because for you and I, so often, we want to be right, we want to win, we want to strive. And I believe this is what I like to call silver medal syndrome. You know the most unhappy people at the Olympics? These guys. You know the most content people? Bronze. Yeah, glad to be here. It's cool. So grateful. Man, I made it to the podium. That was, no, that was awesome. I think far too often, we just go, it's not the way I want it. It's not how I want it. People aren't doing what I want. If I could just speak into her life and his life and this life, if I could run the country, it would still be screwed up. If I could do all these things, then it would be better. No, it wouldn't. We live in a broken world with broken people. The only time it changes is when hearts change and when Jesus comes back. And so we look at these things and we go, uh, and I hope that men and women of faith can just go, man, bronze rocks. Man, it's really good to be on team Jesus. I want to love my neighbor. I want to go and feed the homeless. I want to mow my friend's lawn. Actually, they're not my friend. I don't really like them. And I don't like talking to them. And man, they, when they do talk to me, it's really annoying. But man, I'm going to mow their lawn because Jesus loves them too. And they're made in the image of God. I mean, I'm not going to worry about winning. I'm just going to be thankful that I have the movement and the love of God. You know, sometimes it isn't about getting the best. I think there's some chapters in life that are just about enduring. I want to ask you guys one last question as we close. What would your life look like? And you know, we see the words of Jesus. We, we watch the character of this man named Moses who doesn't lash out and lets God do all of that, which, by the way, 
anything that God does is going to be way bigger than anything that you could come up with or think of. And so how would your life change if you trusted in the movement of God and trusted in Jesus and said, I, God, I want to walk in a way that embraces what is calm, that I say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be calm, I'm going to be humble. God, I don't want it to be about me. And God, I want to live a peaceful way of life. See, even in a culture of outrage, when Martin Luther King Jr. Day comes around, everybody talks about, you know, hate can't drive out hate, only love can do that. And then we return the next 24 hours and the next 364 days being pissed off at the world. It's because we go back to the dumpster and we don't trust in the words of Jesus because we think we know better because we feed the outrage machine and we think that our way is the better way and it's not. I have, you know, be 42 this month and I can tell you in 42 years what I've learned is that I don't know a whole lot except that Jesus is so good to me. That he wants what's best for you. And that my way, man, I'm so glad God puts all of that in the dumpster because Jesus' way is so much better. And he could do the same for you. He wants to whether you've trusted in him or not. Because for some, I think the more difficult thing is I trusted you, but now what I've settled into is what I think is the right way. And I'm willing to tell most believers, I know that you think that's right, but half of what you're hanging on to should have been in the dumpster. Let it go. And if you've never trusted him, what are you waiting for? Don't wait for to get all your stuff together because you won't. That's what Jesus does. But when you trust him, it brings about a blessed life watching the character of God well up in you. You won't get it all right all the time, but you will have hope. My prayer is that we could be men and women who trust Jesus, who are filled with hope. But that choice, that choice is yours. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are very, very patient with us. God, Above all else, help us to not go digging again. God, today, I'm willing to bet that there's men and women in here and online who go, man, I didn't like that, to which, God, I would respond good. Because, God, we need a change. We need to be men and women of faith who will outlove the world because it has to be a countercultural life. Jesus turned the world upside down and our lives should mirror that. God, help us to start today by leaving what is in the dumpster behind and trusting in the one who can change our lives in eternity. It's in the name of Jesus who accomplished all of that for us. We pray, amen. We're so grateful for you. You are loved by God. You're loved by this church. You might be like, you don't even know me, man. We love you. And we're all in a journey in this. Nobody's arrived from the nursery to the stage. 
We all have a ways to go in this. And so we learn, we grow together. We want to be able to help you in that journey. Maybe today it's stopping, filling out a card, dropping in the lobby, say, hey, here's how you could be praying for me. Maybe for you today, you go out, like Evan talked about in the beginning of service, you go out to the tents and you meet a small group leader and say, man, I'm going to join a small group. You might be like, oh, I don't want to do that. Go to somebody's house I don't know to talk about a Bible I'm not sure about and open up my life that I do not want to talk about. I don't even talk to my you know, friend about it. I'm not going to talk to strangers. I can tell you this. All of those things are totally valid. And when you begin to explore those, God will change your life in amazing ways. Being around men and women of faith who can help you along in the journey, who will bear the burdens with you. We want to help you. We want to come alongside you. We hope you have an amazing week this week, and we'll see you next time. Peace.